You know, um, this has been titled a conversation, which means, as in every Jewish family, we're going to be interrupting each other. Uh, so hopefully, we will get out an entire thought before someone else jumps in. I, I just want to begin by saying uh, this book, I spend time with this book, and uh, it is probably the best, most honest, most sincere uh, memoir I've ever read. Uh, with all the blemishes and scars that people never usually talk about. And so I, and I'm not getting a percentage of this, I really would recommend you uh, read it, and not only because of the family story, but some of the things that Letty does in this is to raise issues that we are well aware of in our own house as being, you know, never think of them as ha having a, a perspective that's a Shonda, but things that uh, I've never thought about. And uh, certainly there are certain things about women that I obviously never had an insight. I never had a sister. So it was fascinating to me. So having said all that by way of introduction, uh, let's start with how this all began. Uh, Letty, um, I know that Molly was in some ways the, uh, the midwife of this project. That's probably an incorrect term. But um, uh, I, 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 how did this all begin, and, and what gave rise to your decision to make it about secrets and, and, uh, and uh, shame? Uh, okay. Um, I was writing the book as if it was going to be kind of a conventional chronological memoir. I thought um, I was coming up on 80 years old. This was five years ago. <clears throat> And uh, I thought I should really make sense out of my life. And I also wanted to have 12 books, you know, 12 tribes, all that. <laughs> 12 is a, an important number. I didn't want 11. So um, I was clipping along at a nice pace. And looking back on it, it was probably a little boring and pedestrian. And then Molly decided she was um, at college and she had entered a biography course taught by a person who was a biographer of states people and military folks. And he assigned them, his class, to write a biography of a living person. And I get a phone call from Molly one day and she says, Grandma, I'd like very much to write about you, but there's a proviso here. Because I immediately said, oh, how great, how wonderful. <laughs> who wouldn't? Who wouldn't be flattered that their granddaughter wants to write about them? And she said, you can't touch it. If I find something that makes you uncomfortable, you can't edit it out. This has to be an unauthorized biography. Well, with trepidation, I said, I promise I won't touch it, right? <clears throat> and um, she goes through her scholar kind of choreography, that, because she's a very good student. She reads all my books or reads through them. She reads... Mm, probably hundreds of my articles, I don't know how, but she goes up to my archive at Smith College. And then she says, Where, you know, she, where's the rest of the youthful, your, you know, younger stuff? I said, well, you can come to my study and you'll go through stuff. And she looks at clippings of magazines and she looks at my files and then she said, no, no, I want, I want the you know, personal stuff, the childhood stuff. And I say, oh, I threw everything in a cabinet. You know, I haven't looked at that stuff for years. And the two of us crouch down and look in. She takes out my teenage diaries, the ones that, you know, we all kept with a lock and key, as, this we, as if we would be invaded by the CIA if we didn't lock our, <laughs> lock our little diaries. She thumbs through it. And she said, this is, this is great. This is great. What else is in there? And I am looking through, literally, in this deep cabinet, and I see this old shopping bag. It's stuffed. It's a, I pull it out. It's a plastic shopping bag. Like, if you're old enough to remember S. Klein or Orbax, <laughs> that kind of a big shopping bag. <clears throat> and I pull it out, and I suddenly remember what it is. It's letters that my sister found when my, my mother died in 1955. And my sister gave to me when she was dying nine years before this event, this discovery takes place. And Molly says, well, what, what, what's in there? And I said, well, these are, looks like letters from like 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago. She says, oh, I don't need that stuff. <laughs> I'm just doing, you know, I'm doing your life. And I upended on the dining room table, and I see letters between my parents, hundreds of them. I see documents, citizenship papers, divorce papers, 
So this ordinary memoir was suddenly informed by original material, source material, that in today's world, think about it, doesn't exist anymore. You know, I, 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 uh, I found it so interesting, and as a matter of fact, I suggested before that this should be made into a television uh, program because every, every letter revealed something that, if not the secret itself, was really tickled the possibility of what is this about. Right. Uh, Abby, you, are, you do the same kind of work in a certain way. Uh, you've written books about other people, you know, the stars of, uh, stars of David, I think it was called. Um, what was it like for you? Were there surprises in it for you? As you did, how much of this did you know as it was going along? Well, first, I just want to pause and thank you for doing this because I don't know if everyone realizes this is um, Rabbi Emeritus of Central Synagogue and a huge figure in my family's life. So not only is he a great uh, interrogator, um, but and he was officiant at Molly's Bat Mitzvah, um, but I'm just so lucky to have both my clergy here tonight, and they, they have shaped us as, as a family, not just as Jews. So applause for you. Thank you. Um, I would just Angela say- Angela here? <laughs> oh, okay, give her a hand too. Angela, great. <laughs> we, can we can applaud the clergy. Um, <laughs> I would say that the one thing that in my conversations with mom as she was preparing to do this was that I said all of the Shandas of your youth, which were very intertwined with what it meant to be an immigrant and want to tell a story, a particular kind of story when you came to America and make sure that that story was what you wanted other people to know and not what you didn't want. What you, what you wanted to omit was very conscious, very careful. And I thought that was really going to be um, very rich territory. But I also nudged her to be honest about the things that she struggled with in our own more contemporary family since, since my existence and, and my daughter's of things that my mother didn't necessarily for all of her openness and everyone knows she's an incredible pioneer and, and a courageous activist. And we can talk about some of the things that she wanted to air that sometimes, you know, my sister and my brother and I didn't actually want to talk about. She was very much about opening secrets up but there were still things that my mom um, was kind of keeping closed in her own kind of Shonda framework that I said, if you're going to write this book, you've got to do it all. Um, and we can talk about some of those things, but I think that part of what was so interesting for all of us as a family to watch her process was that in a way she was pushing herself to go deeper than she ever has about stories that she has explored before, but not at the depth that this book does it. Yeah, Molly, I'm going, uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention that there are people who are live streaming, so we want to welcome them to this activity as well, so we're glad you joined us. Um, I'm going to ask you this question because you're the furthest from the generation in which Shonda was a common word. Um, and um, uh, from your perspective, how would you define it? Well, first of all, I should say, I thought it was about Shonda Rhimes at first, which Graham had <laughs> made a disclaimer about. Um, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I do think of it as um, shame, but most commonly associate, associated with stigma today. So the things that we hide because uh, we don't want our peers to see it, the things we wouldn't post on social media in today's terms. So I, I see it less as your shame about being gay or having an abortion or being an immigrant and more about your shame uh, of not having a nice house or not having a happy life. So I think that the, the conversations shifted, but the, the shame still exists. That's interesting because there were things that, uh, as you went through the book letter, you, you talked about it being kind of time fixed, right? Certain things that the immigrant generation were time fixed, so especially on the Lower East Side and then on the Upper West Side, which of course is where it seems that the Shandas were rampant. Um, uh, if, if that's true, that means that every generation has its own, right? So, Abby, we heard from Molly what it is for her generation. What would it be for yours? You know, I think there still is um, a sense of wanting to package your story, even though there's so much oversharing, there's so much TMI, and in a way, that's its own currency now, certainly with celebrities, right? We, whether they're in People Magazine or it's a tell-all book or the interview, you, know, you choose your moments to kind of bear it all, and sometimes it's actually to, ex, ex, you know, in, in some ways to do repentance. Um, we're seeing that now. If that's sort of how you get yourself out of a fix is to do the interview where you bear all or um, in some way do a, you know, a, um, a t atonement. 
uh, to keep in the Jewish framework. But what I would say I still feel, and I think I absorbed it somewhat from my mom, is a, a sense of like, oh, do you need to, you don't need to share that. We, there's still a protectiveness that I don't think is all bad, um, but that I think I was raised with of a, just of a sense of like, we keep certain things in the family. And when there's chinks in the armor or when there's difficulty, we don't necessarily have to have it, you know, go beyond our walls. And I think there, there are benefits and there's, uh, and there's detriments to that. Yeah, so that Shah very rarely is heard today, right? It was, but it was heard, certainly, uh, you and I are close in age in terms of the generation. You know, it's pasnish. I mean, there are certain things that were made very clear. You don't touch that. You certainly don't speak it in open. But Letty, I'm interested if you would be able to share that beach scene you know, when I think in a certain way that was the, the birth of all this investigation and, and really the, the, in a certain way, the format of secret. Uh, it was, yes. You know, could you explain that and tell what it was? Yes. Um, I was 12 years old. I believed myself to be um, the second daughter of a long married couple. I, had, I believed I had a sister and that was it. I was, we were normal American Jewish people in a, in a family of conservative, you know, leanings, conservative Judaism. And that, that was my view of my world. And uh, I knew my mother was an immigrant. I knew she came over here in, and she'd been very poor. I never heard the details because it would be a Shanda. My mother didn't want me to think of her in terms of poverty. The immigrant experience was assimilation, you know, pure assimilation, not retaining the culture as it is for today's immigrants, quite. So I knew my father to be uh, born in America. He used to lord it over my mother because she was, quote, a greenhorn. Um, and then at 12 years old, I discover through a, 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 an awful scene with a cousin of mine who threw cards at me while we were playing gin rummy at a, at a weekend bar mitzvah in Winthrop, Massachusetts because I was beating her at gin and I had 33 points from one hand. And you were younger. And she was 10 years older than I. I was 12, she was 22, and I had 33 points on her in one hand. <laughs> and she said, you think you're so great, you know, and you think your family's so great. Well, you know, they weren't even, your mother wasn't even in our family until my, fa your, my uncle married your mother. And your sister isn't even your whole sister. So I'm listening to this after playing Jin Rami, and I feel the whole world crash in. I mean, how does a 12-year-old absorb that kind of information? And so I did what anyone would do, I guess. What any nervous system would do, I just blacked out. And I woke up on the floor, and my parents were each kneeling on either side of me, and they said, come, Ketzala, come, we'll, we'll just go out, we'll walk on the beach, we'll tell you everything. And what they told me was the truth, finally, that... Uh, each of them had been married before, that my sister was my half-sister, that my mother, that was my mother's daughter, and um, eventually they told me that my father had a daughter himself, who he had abandoned when he married my mother. Um, taking all this in was, for me, a kind of fulcrum moment, as you might expect. I, I stopped trusting adults. I think it made me a writer. I think it made me a feminist because writers peel things back and because feminists suddenly identify with what is it that you're hiding as a woman? What do you feel you can't own up to? And clearly my mother couldn't own up to divorce because in 1927 when she and my father each divorced, were divorced from their first spouses, divorce was a super shanda. Plus my mother had been abused how could that be? I mean, how could she ever present herself in the world as a single mother and a formerly abused wife when everybody knows Jews, Jewish men don't abuse. Everybody knows Jews aren't alcoholics. Everybody knows Jews aren't homosexuals. All of that was the sort of climate in which this secret emerged. Today, what's, what's a previous marriage? Nothing much at all, unless it's still a hidden thing. If it was hidden, if there's a shame associated with it, as there was in the case of my parents, they moved when they got married in 1937, divorced in 1927, married to each other in 37. They moved from the Bronx to Queens 
cleaned the slate and presented themselves as people who were married in 1923, my sister. My, they, they had my sister in 1925, they had me in 1939. Ganug, that was who we were until all this came spilling out. And at that point, I just, um, I, my world crashed. I, my parents were liars. How do you, how do you live with liars? And it, but it goes back even before that in terms of your grandparents' generation. Right. Oh, exactly. Uh, Abby, how much of this did you, have you heard? I mean, I really knew that, and I also, I watched mom growing up, we, we all did, the three of us, um, keeping these really meticulous photo albums that actually scrapbooks is what you call them because it had every scrap of our lives, everything that we drew, everything we wrote, everything that mom ever did professionally. It's just when the grandchildren are born, she continued it. There's a book for every single year. And I can tell you that shelf is heavy and large <laughs> and precious. 59 scrapbooks. But it also felt like something um, very in, in, intentional and almost like... Uh, Pathological. I was going to say it, and that's why I stumbled. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm trying to be careful here. Can you tell? Yes. I mean, it was, it was almost like obsessive. I am going to keep a record. This is never going to happen again. There's going to be evidence. There's going to be dates. You're going to be able to connect the dots. There's never going to be someone, as mom has explained before, that gets cut out of a picture so that it's suddenly uh, the, the right family portrait. Right. Um, and I think I, I pass a little bit of that on, you know, similar to my mom for all of her feminism, and I don't think they're incompatible, but people are surprised, is a very traditional Jewish mother. So, yes, she was, I think, a rabble rouser and a troublemaker in the best sense, but she also set a very careful Erev Rosh Hashanah Kol Nidre table, and we all dressed up, and, you know, the menorah collection, and, and things having a certain way, and so that's where, and she wore Laura Ashley dresses, which is something she doesn't want to remember, because <laughs> we were all dressed in Laura Ashley dresses. It was like, that was the child abuse of my... <laughs> <laughs> but they're just, you know, my mom is not, you know, wearing, well, she's wearing cowboy boots now, but she's not necessarily kind of the unshaven feminist kind of like not, you know, the, all, of the, all of the stereotypes that are so unfair about that term. My mom was in, in many ways also still holding on to traditions that she felt so strongly would also matter to us. And so I kind of felt like there was a repair, almost like, as we say, tikkun, in the way that she raised us. Like, you're not going to be at sea. You're going to know your roots, and you're going to have your traditions, and you're going to pass them on. Yeah. That's exactly. But, but Molly, so you, you've good. grown up in a very... <laughs> That's really so clear. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sense. glad I'm here to do the therapy with you. <laughs> uh, you, you grew up as an heir to all this. Uh, and yet I, you know, look, I, I, can th I think of your generation is the difference between your mom and your grandmother is certainly vast, but the difference between your generation and your mom's generation is even vaster. I mean, there's even greater distance, greater change. Um, so how does this come to you, the, the idea of being so meticulous about record keeping and so on? Now people don't even keep written diaries, right, I guess. Yeah, I was thinking about, less about the record keeping, but the, the ways that you raised my mom and then my mom raised me. I feel like your loss really impacted how you raised my mom and the way that you raised my mom really impacted, obviously, I guess this is how families work. I should but, just say I was 15 when my mother died. I didn't get to say that. And I, I was rereading that biography that was talked about. Um, and one of the lines that I remember finding in one of your books was, I sometimes think my mother mothered me best by dying. And I was later confused about what that meant, and I learned that you meant that you were less fearful, you were less coddled. And I think you passed some of that on to my mom, who then, I think in turn, felt more of a need to, co to coddle my brother and I. And I, and I say that only in a, I think there's just, it shows how the, there's really not a right way to parent you did an incredible inherited job. trauma it's inherited trauma but it was it was an interesting thing to realize how how much you were shaped by the loss of your mother in a way I think I didn't appreciate until writing that and revisiting it and I think it impacted even how I was raised and how I exist today and I think I'm more fearful than you were in your life but and you that's, don't have the shame factor. Right, you don't have the Shonda factor. Just take the compliment. She, she just has the trauma. <laughs> <laughs> but it is all to say, I think that the, that there, um, 
that a lot of what made you that feminist was was your mother's loss, and I think that's pretty poignant. I have to say, I, I, I can't really see, but I think I have some grandchildren out there. Raise your hands. <laughs> three, of, three of so four grandchildren of the six are here. So you have an amazing inheritance to have to absorb and clarify for yourselves. We'll have you back in a few years. <laughs> I would just say, though, as Mom, Molly, I've never heard that take, but what's so right about it, I remember I used to, when I traveled for work, because I was working for 60 minutes for a while, and I had to leave a lot, and I had anxiety about it, and I think part of it was knowing that my mom lost her mom young and thinking about how, how indelible that was. And I would write these notes to Molly and leave them before every trip, and I remember her asking me, really, at like seven years old, I know you mean well, but please stop doing that. <laughs> I think it was just like I was already kind of saying goodbye every time, in a way. You know, there were, there, um, I, I pointed out to Letty that I found, um, I try to track her family tree, um, which is here and for sale. Um, because <laughs> it, um, because you, when you talked about how you met your Sis, how you discovered your sit? You had two half sisters, right? How that happened? Um, the way you found out about one was so extraordinary. I mean, it's you know, it's and it's, you think about Bashir. How is it destined that you, this was going to happen? Tell us about that. Uh, are you mean how I met my other sister? Yeah. Yeah. So my mother had cancer. I didn't know it because one of the Shandas in my family was illness. You couldn't talk about the C word at all. So by the time somebody thought to tell me, it was kind of a little too late. And you know, you, you, you can't communicate with somebody who's in the process of dying and on morphine. So I kind of lost the opportunity to have that conversation and learn more about my mother and what she wanted to leave for me and as a heritage and all of that. And so while she's sick, I open the door. She's in her bed. I'm doing my homework. Uh, by this time, I'm 14. There's a doorbell, we're living in Jamaica, there's a, door, a doorbell ring, and I open the door, and there's a woman standing there with her back to me, when she has a braid, long braid down her back, and she wheels around, and she puts out her hand, and she says, hello, Bunny, I'm your sister, Rena. Now, Bunny was my childhood name. She hadn't seen me since I was born. That was the last time before my father abandoned her. She was... Um, a, a, a teenager when I was a baby. And so she called me what she knew my parents called me, which was Bunny, and there she was. She turned out to be a, a professor at Hunter College, uh, one of the world's leading authorities as an anthropologist on gypsy culture. And um, I became besotted with her because she was so different from my other sister who had four children in Larchmont. So suddenly I have this professor with 180 IQ and multisyllabic vocabulary, and she's taking me to gypsy um, dinners, you know, receptions or, or rituals, and my life has broadened, and I was really close to her for a couple of years until I went to Brandeis, and I discovered there were other people with 180 IQs who were also interesting, and I no longer sort of you know, uh, genuflected to her intellectually, and uh, little by little by little, we, we grew apart. And I, that's one of the things I am the most ashamed of in the book, is how I kind of let that go. Mm -hmm. I let that relationship go, and she had a deeply wounded life in every way, except she was brilliant, but everything else about her life was tragic. And I kind of gave up, I gave it up. Yeah, I, uh, there were certain things, um, you know, you talk about the things that you had to hide about yourself. You know, it was, you know part of one part of the book was private shame, and then you go to kind of public shame and so on. Um, but there were certain, there are two things I want to ask you about, because as a man, they, I had, they had the most incredible impact at me, on me after, you know, I'm, I'm grown. And one was about a woman and her menstrual cycle. And, and that, for me, the story you told uh, in that book, in that chapter, it was just, I mean, it just ripped my heart out. Wow. Thank you, Peter. And, you know, I've been talking about this book since September 13th. I've had a lot of people interview me, and nobody ha has asked me that. Has Thank you for that, because 
it was a, a scarring experience that I had, um, I think it was in fourth grade, I can't remember exactly, where a, a refugee child, because don't forget, um, I was nine in the, and, and that was uh, in 1948. So it wasn't that long after the war and this little refugee girl was in my class. And she took the wooden pass that you need, you ask permission to go to the bathroom and you get a wooden pass. And when she came back with the wooden pass to the fourth grade classroom, her, her menstrual pad, her Kotex pad, was ha dangling out of the back of her skirt. She hadn't realized that she hadn't secured it. I mean, I can't even tell you what this, it's, it's like a, a chastity belt, what we used to wear. These things with hooks and... Okay, Mom. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was hanging out and the boys started pointing and ridiculing her and then the, the girls just shut up because it's like, well, we wouldn't do that. We're not like that, you know. And they didn't stop the ridicule. And I, my whole life I was always terrified that people would know when I was menstruating. So I was so ashamed of my own bodily function as a result of what I saw kids do to this, this girl in, in a fourth grade classroom. Yeah. That's a scarring thing. And yet so many women have internalized some version of that. You know, we grew up ashamed. We were terrified. If I wore a white skirt, you know, I was terrified. Yeah, well, you have one sentence in that chapter, I think in that chapter, where you make a, an incredible point that, you know, what a woman goes through in, in her kind of uh, age, uh, her teen age, uh, talked about and has a stigma, whereas what a man goes through, right, does not. I mean, it's, you know, men talk about it in a very different way. So, you know, I just found that, you know, tremendously impacting uh, from, from my perspective. Um, uh, Abby, there, she deals with a lot of other subjects uh, <laughs> in, the, in the book. Uh, you know, talking about kind of using Shonda as a, a touchstone for it. Uh, were there some things in there that uh, you found interesting and important? And <laughs> I'm not pushing I know where anything. you're going. He's not pushing. But there is a chapter, for those who don't know, on, on the fact that I was with someone who was not Jewish and um, very seriously for a while. Um, and I didn't end up with him, and my wonderful husband is here. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and not that it matters, but he happens to be Jewish. But, <laughs> but what did, did matter is that it was a, a time where I saw my mother kind of become Tevia before my eyes. <laughs> and, and for all of her liberal values and her openness and her acceptance, she was extremely the antithesis to all those things, which was very shut down, very panicked. Um, and I can say this because it's in the book, and uh, it was not a great time for us, and we're extremely close and extremely loving, and we talk about everything, and it was a time of really two years of really not being able to talk very easily. And I think that part of what I learned was just, it was so much of that upbringing that she had, and she describes it in the book in a way I never understood before, that the, the post-Holocaust generation really felt like you had to replenish a people that had been decimated. That that was, a, was very real, this sense of carrying on, not just in this idea of continuity that we hear every Jewish organization bemoan and worry about. It was so concrete, it was so actual um, and, and chilling in the sense that the millions had been lost. And so there really was that charge that we have to have Jewish children and and that this has to survive. And she also saw it in a way as a referendum on what she had given me and where she had failed. Like it didn't matter enough to me. Now, I hadn't said I was going to raise Catholic children, but I was with someone who was Catholic who cared about his Catholicism. So I think reading this and, and talking to her as we, we came to a, a much, I think, deeper, more honest, closer place through this book, that it isn't look, perfect Oprah, everything is tied up with a bow, but it sort of forced us to reckon with old history, I think, in a way that, um, and I'm not, I don't think that either was right or wrong, but I think what you realize is that this is such a, today, where the majority of Jews, I don't have to tell you, are not marrying other Jews, um, there, there is a sense when I look back at even that history, which was early 90s, of just, it feels almost like of another time, mm -hmm. where it was going to be a Shonda for her. It yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in the reconciliation, and, and who pushed that, and how did it happen? I flew, I flew out, she left. 
she moved with. Well, mom, I didn't like. I mean, you moved with your boyfriend to, in fact, Stanford, where he went to law school. <laughs> but <laughs> she moved internationally then. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, and we communicated. Our communication really was pretty shut down. I mean, we talk, there was no internet then, so either you talked or you, or you wrote, and we did very little of either for like a year, and it was agonizing for me and I finally got myself to a place where I said I will not lose my my daughter to save the Jewish people I, I simply won't I, I really felt that I I will not lose my daughter to save the Jewish people someone else has to take her that part and uh, I flew out to California t to meet with her and uh, we I'll we never forget it and I said I will learn to love your you're this man if you choose him, and I will lo love your children, whatever you decide. Molly, as you listen to this, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested because you're of a different generation, um, and uh, you're in a certain way where you, your mom, not quite where your mom was, is in terms of age, I guess, but maybe so. Um, how does that, you know, the stories they're telling here, and this, what you can read in the book, and the, the act of reconciliation, and the decisions that were made, how does that impact you? <laughs> um, it's definitely it definitely weighs on me. I would say I think I I think I would be lying if I did not if I if I said I did not feel the pressure to marry a Jewish person um, who would be more welcome at the table on <laughs> Rosh Hashanah. But I also have seen my family welcome plenty of people that might be called the stranger with open arms, and I think that would be an important test for us, honestly. I think that we probably need some of that. So I definitely feel the pressure. I definitely am aware that, speaking to my rabbi, I, sh I, I would love to be married to a Jewish person, but I also am open-minded and recognize that's not really the landscape. Um, it's not as easy to meet a Jew anymore. <laughs> um, so so I, think, I think I'm of two minds, but I, hearing this story, see a lot of what I think it reverberates throughout your book, which is a tension between the, the movement or the greater cause and the family, and whether that was about being home with the kids or going to the feminist rally or um, supporting a non-Jewish partner or um, going to synagogue. I don't know what the other option is there. I think that that was a tension that you wrestled with a lot and that in your book you face, which we hadn't really talked about, I think, in our family before. No, we hadn't, but, you know, I am forever changed by it. So, in a way, that opened the door for grandchildren to, I just want you guys to be happy. I don't really look at religion anymore the way I did. Um, honest, honestly, it just somehow doesn't matter to me. But, Letty, when you, you wrote this episode, if my, if my memory serves me, you talk about legacy. And you saw a legacy in a very specific way. And now you're suggesting that you see legacy differently in, in that your legacy is really much more in the, in the line of your family than in the necessarily saving the Jewish yeah, people. Yeah, and it's also, Peter, in the fact that the way our, my grandchildren are Jewish, I know that it will, it will permeate their lives, enrich their lives. What, whatever Judaism is to them, it's, it's real. So they don't need to marry it. Yeah. You, you ought to read, read my sermon um, about intermarriage. I'll, 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 but I'm not studying for law school exams. I'll, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> that I can't help it. Uh, one other um, issue that you raise, uh, Letty, is uh, I think it was your cousin, your, uh, it was Faith, um, and, and her situation, because that. I mean, if ever it has been made even more real, it's in our own day in terms of you know how that's treated and what is. Can you tell us about it, or one of you can tell them about? Uh, Faith, who we called Sissy until she was married, um, was I have I have twenty five. Co I'm one of twenty five cousins. My parents each were one of seven, and they were spouses. So I have a lot of family, a lot of cousins, and all my cousins were like Garrison Keeler, you know, above average. Except for Sissy, who was clearly now looking back a, a, a person with deficits, physical and and mental, and nobody talked about it. So when my so of my cousins, I had one who was my best friend named Prissy, and <laughs> thank you, Peter. He remembered Sissy and Prissy, and she <laughs> um, and Prissy and I would you know create absolutely 
um, professional style theater pieces for the family. We would sing, we would create um, museum displays of our art. We were very, we were very inventive little girls and we were busy all the time in inventing and creating and doing that. And Sissy just couldn't keep up and she couldn't play pickup sticks and she couldn't play, she'd go fish. So we were always just required to play with her, play with Sissy. And we had a lot of trouble playing with Sissy and nobody helped us. And in the book, I say that one of the things I'm ashamed of to this day is that Prissy and I locked Sissy in the chicken coop and left her there screaming on our, at our parents' little rundown farm in Shrub Oak. And that image of her coming out with feathers in her hair and a red face, I, I can't live it down. Uh, but it, it had a, a writing about it and getting it on the page and expressing how awful I was and that I don't, I will never forgive myself for it has also sensitized me anew to the importance in the Jewish community of just saying what is. If people had given us language, if people had said, maybe you could play this game with Sisti, you know, or Sisti loves to do that, why don't, why don't we set up a, I mean, you made a tea party and Sisti would knock over the cups. So there must have been a way that we could maybe, you know, make um, Play-Doh or whatever was its equivalent in the 1940s. But we've got to confront and and revise and and bring candor and honesty to what the Jewish world, how the Jewish world views deficits in people when we all think we're so great. You know, it's yeah. a problem. I, I want Abby and, and Molly, uh, your, your mother and your grandmother, talk about shame. She talks about and defines shame and guilt, uh, and and tries to draw a distinction between them. Um, and actually talks about positive shame, right? I think that the language is used. Uh, and you're, without necessarily recalling exactly what she said, uh, do, you, do you have something to say about keeping secrets? And do well, you? Well, I have a lot to say about guilt. <laughs> <laughs> so what, yes, tell us. I don't, um, I, I don't feel like, uh, I don't feel particularly that secrets are ever positive. But I do see that there are certain things, certain people who should get them in, in terms of trust. I mean, I, I'm going to raise it, even though she doesn't always talk about it, but it's a very powerful chapter and it opens the book, is my mother having uh, a brain tumor that, thank God, turned out not to be cancerous. But she was just not going to tell a soul. And we felt, my sister and my brother and I, just like, what? this is a time for your friends and your, I mean, she, obviously she told the grandchildren and um, and our husbands and, gathered but, everyone together at an Indian restaurant. Yes, Sapphire. It's a very good restaurant. <laughs> um, but but it was just so clear that my mom was still like, I don't want people to think I have a disease like this. I care so much that people still think I can write and work, and that this would affect my brain. I don't want them to think essentially I'm losing my mind. I mean, just so dug in and. And that's where I guess she and I part ways in that way because I feel like my friends, um, some of whom are here, are just my ballast and my oxygen. And I wouldn't, and I want them to know the ugliest, truest, hardest things and not necessarily just when I'm ready to package it. I want them to walk the walk with me. Um, and I feel like that's where sometimes mom is just a little more careful and closed. I don't know if you I mean, I felt that, I think that was one of my discoveries, not to keep hearkening back to the biography, but that was really where I feel like I learned the most about you. And I think the lack of transparency about the complexities of having it all, of being a feminist with a family, with, uh, with a large social life, with a really good marriage, I think I would have benefited from knowing those things younger and from knowing that you weren't always the activist that you were. I, one of the things I discovered in writing this was her biography is littered with boys. <laughs> and everyone I talked to said she was the prettiest girl at Brandeis, which she claims uh, she does not remember. But, um, but I think I would have liked to know that, the cheerleader Letty, the, the player Letty, rather than just the activist Letty, because I think that would have helped me in my upbringing feel more comfortable having a little fun and, and doing, doing, um, doing something outside, I think, what our family approved of. 
two things, if I may, Peter. The rebuttal. <laughs> Law school. <laughs> um, uh, besides just hiding it from my friends, there's a Jewish subtext here. That's right. I was raised that you don't have to be pretty. You don't have to do anything but be smart. If you're a girl, be smart. If you're a boy, you, you, you have to be smart and work at a job where you don't get dirty. That was basically what the way I was raised. So for me to have a tumor in my brain, and before I knew that it was benign, and it was removed, and that's the end of it. I want you to know that's the end of it. It's <laughs> the end of it, and that was nine years ago, okay? Um, you know, that threatened my sense of who I am as a person. I'm a, a Jewish woman who has intellectual leanings and uses her mind and uses her mouth, and suddenly people are going to, and this is the way I was raised, what will people think? Will people think I, my editors won't hire me? You know, I, I, Nora Ephron kept the whole thing a secret, and I understood it completely. She didn't tell anybody, even her closest friends, because... She explained that she was dying. She was dying. When she, I think the whole world knows Nora's story, but yes, she was, she was dying, and she kept it a secret for something like six years before it actually got her. Um, I, I understood that because people look at you. I, I would have been looked at as brain tumor girl. You know, you see me, you're waiting for me to slip up. I'm not going to remember something. I'll slur a word, you know. Suddenly, and people will say, okay, that's it. She's, she's, go she's about to go, you know. I didn't want to have to deal with that. That was a whole layer. Um, and, and even now when you tell, say it, it makes me still very uncomfortable because... As you know, Blue Greenberg, who's a member of my Rosh Chodesh group, I have a wonderful Rosh Chodesh group that, that's a first of the month women's group. It's like a consciousness raising group. And I first outed myself with the brain tumor to them. And I said, look, it just matters to me that people not think I have brain cancer because then they'll be waiting for me to die. And they said, no, no, you got it. You know, it was benign. It's out, and so and so. And then I get home, and there's an email from Blue Greenberg that says, I feel so terrible that we couldn't be with you during your brain struggle with brain cancer. I mean, you don't hear benign. You hear brain tumor. And that's what I didn't want to have to deal with. So it wasn't that I was resisting intimacy. I was protecting myself from being... No, you raise another point, which uh, you know, I don't want to dwell on. But it, it is very often when people are sick, other people don't know how to talk to approach them. them right. Partially because it winds up that the patient is, is comforting the, the visitor. And, and I think patients don't want to do that, right? They have enough, don't have uh, limitless uh, energy. Um, I'm going to, uh, because we, we <laughs> you know, we would, I could keep going, we could keep going. Um, uh, but we want to take some questions. Uh, if you could, I'm going to give you a, I'm, I don't think you've ever, well, no, that's true. I know Abby's been given the opportunity. But the rest of you, if you were to give uh, a one-sentence sermon um, to this group that would come out of what this book has taught, what would it be? I will, I will say, it's easy for me. I wish everybody a secret free life. It's, it's so wonderful to unburden. It's all on the page for me, but it's, Thanksgiving is coming up. It's a great opportunity for you and your families to share. Happy? Um, I, I guess I would modify it and say, um, tell the truth to those who can make you feel glad that you did. That's good. Molly? I think, I think I would say, the one sentence thing is a tough one. Um, you, could, you can put commas in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and semicolons. Um, to seek out vulnerability and recognize false vulnerability. Because I think, this is my parenthetical, I think our, my generation's really good at false vulnerability, but to really look for honest connection. Mm -hmm. um, wow, and that's that, where I think the secrets are. That's fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Grandma. Um, <laughs> this, false vulnerability as a power. 
Yeah. Yeah. Quote me on that. No. You know, well, this, is, this has been an extraordinarily <laughs> powerful you, Thank conversation. Thank you, Peter. Um, Thank you all. We're, uh, we're going to have um, uh, an opportunity for a limited number of questions because of time. Uh, I, uh, so why, why don't you raise your hand? I may not be able to see you, so just raise your hand. Yes, sir? I'll, I will try to repeat the question so everybody hears. Did you get a good grade on your biography? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> By the way. First question. Well, uh, this is a Jewish audience, right? Not, <laughs> they not would want to know whether your tuition cost is worth it. <laughs> what was your grade? Is that what I, I, I got an A, though my grandma said I got an A+. Plus, <laughs> which wasn't an option. <laughs> uh, uh, y yes. Ryan, is that you? Ryan. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I'm, uh, we didn't talk about that tonight, I don't know if you want to go there, but I'm curious to know from the three of you, uh, what are the public shames that really bother you now, uh, today? What do you, what, what are you, as a Jew, as a feminist, as a human being, mm -hmm. really bothered about or shameful to you personally or to others? Right. Jews? Well, uh, I, I'm not going to get too political, but I will say that Donald Trump shames me every time he opens his mouth. Um, the government of the state of Israel, because I was eight years old when the state was founded and cared deeply about its survival as a Jewish democratic state, and I get ashamed when they treat Palestinians in the way we used to be treated. I'm ashamed of that. Um, those two things are probably top of my list. Um, great. <laughs> uh, uh, I will just go with what I'm seeing more and more, just because I happen to be, uh, my focus as a journalist is the Jewish world, is how Jews shame each other right Ooh. now. Um, label, judge, and um, in a way, exile each other. Molly, mm. you mm. <laughs> I'm the one with a with a long, long life ahead, so I'm trying to be careful here. Not to say that you're, you don't have long lives ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think going on my mom's point, I think there is a, a sad shame in being a Jew on campuses right now wow. that my rabbi, Rabbi Bookdahl, spoke about in her sermon um, that I think really resonated with a lot of me and my classmates, that there is somehow an association immediately by saying you're Jewish, that you support Israel, which is a very fraught position right now. So I've been really struggling with that personally. Does that keep people from saying that? I, I think it keeps, it, it makes me hesitate, definitely. I can't speak for others. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, Ron Karnish, is that you? Oh, so, all right, there he is, Letty. Uh, oh, by the I'm way, Ron Cronin uh, wrote a Possible. great review of the book in the Jerusalem, I think it was Jerusalem Report. Jerusalem Post. Report. Thank Jerusalem you, Ron. Report. Um, and I would also take the opportunity to suggest that if you get a chance, uh, Letty has a newsletter that goes out and you can subscribe to it. It's very worthwhile. Even I read it. And uh, uh, I am waiting for Molly to um, you know, find her own voice regularly so that I could read her every, every week. Mm. And um, maybe you could just publish chapters of your, of oh, your no. <laughs> biography. And uh, Abby is, um, you know, is often doing this, right? Except she's sitting in my chair and she's doing conversations. Uh, it was uh, somewhat um, difficult for me to be in the, in the being, interviewing somebody who is so expert and is, speaks so well and is such an extraordinary uh, uh, understander of the, uh, of the Jewish people and the issues that we're facing. So you all have it. All right, other questions? <laughs> yes. I just wanted to know, and this is a great event, thank you all so much. If you ever feel that there is a place for secrets. The, qu the question for the, those online is, the, uh, is there a place for, for secrets? For me, um, the only secrets I keep are other people's secrets. I would not, I would not uh, divulge other people's secrets. But uh, my goal is really to lead a secret-free life. I, I've had enough secrets to last three lifetimes mm -hmm. in my family. I think the answer is yes, and I'll just leave it there. 
You know, um, Letty, I'm going to ask you, just because in a certain way was the germ germination of all this, you didn't talk about that kind of uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof story oh, of, grandparents. of your grandparents, which was, in a way, set the stage for everything. For everything. You're for everything. so right. Yeah. Um, so my grandmother was betrayed. This is Fiddler on the Roof. Think of title, right? Who is engaged by her family, betrothed by her family, to Laser Wolf, which was a much older guy, in other words. It's all the equivalents from, from Fiddler. And she's in love with Muddle the Tailor, which was my grandfather, who turned out to be the man that she loved. So you have this set up, and Jewish girls in 1898 did not um, disobey a parent's match, a shidduch. But my, grand, my grandmother, after the wedding ceremony, was in the um, bridal chamber while her supposed husband was changing. And she tied all the bed sheets together and she jumped out the window and ran away to my grandfather. So she was what's called a runaway bride, which was, a, again, a Shonda. And um, I didn't know it. Nobody in my family knew it. All my cousins that I just told you about, we didn't know it. And when my Aunt Tilly, I, everyone I recommend should have an Aunt Tilly, who just spews, and she let loose the truth that my grandmother had married before she got married to my grandfather. And she said, but don't tell anybody it's a Shonda. I said, well, what's a Shonda about that? She said, he never gave her a get. A get is a Jewish divorce decree, and in order to have a legal divorce, you have to place it, the man has to place it in the woman's hands. Well, my grandmother didn't stop on her way out the window to ask for a get. So um, they, that was the Shonda. The big Shonda was that, you know, were, were our, our, was my grandmother's marriage to my grandfather legal? Was she a bigamist? All of that was hidden. I look at it as, as if we had known that this little Jewish lady who makes apple strudel and hardly talks because she only speaks Yiddish, my grandmother Jenny, who I never really knew even though she lived in our finished basement for many years, this woman was Wonder Woman. You know, that this woman took her life in her hands in, 19, in 1898 and chose the man she wanted and that was so transgressive and revolutionary. If my female cousins and I had known that, you know, it just would have changed our view of her and maybe our view of how rebellious we could be, you know? You know, but there was, uh, I'm just, because we have, uh, I'm taking the liberty, uh, unless there are other questions, but um, the, the, the Nathan story, I mean, you had siblings that were born... In, over in the old country, and then you had siblings that were born here. You're right. Uh, and your my mother did. And your mother came, and he she gets off the boat with the children, and he wants a divorce. Yeah, right. right? And so, that, in so, a way, was so poignant because, in a certain way, it it had some impact on my family as well. Um, my grandfather Nathan, who was Muddle the Taylor, did not turn out to be Muddle the Taylor. If you think Hester Street, that's who he turned out to be. He had a woman, while my grandmother was with the four children over in Pilipits in Hungary, and when he got there, he said he wanted a divorce and had to be cajoled into and almost blackmailed into staying in the marriage, but in return, he could have the affair, which he did continue for 20 years or more. Yeah. So, you know, not everything is pretty. And I was raised to cover up what's not pretty. You know? You we know, wanted I, to be real Americans. We wanted to show the Jewish people to be exceptional and all that. Well, I, I just want to... We're going I to, wonder if we have any uh, questions online. Uh, I wouldn't know. No. I see somebody wagging their head no. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're, so we have to bring this to a close. Um, just a last comment. I, I think not only was this book so 
poignant in terms of its honesty and, and the ability to share stories that were kind of, in a certain way, unbelievable. And as I said, some of them just took my breath away. But it also, in a way, gave, I think, gives the reader the opportunity to clarify their own lives and clear up their, their secrets. And, and uh, I think the concept of a secret-free life is something that's important. I also think the uh, idea of uh, good shame uh, is important. Those things that people should be ashamed about in terms of their misbehavior. Maybe I should just say one thing about good shame because it doesn't necessarily register. Good shame is another word for conscience. You know, you don't want to be shameless. So uh, I, I uh, illustrated in the book with the simplest and most prosaic of stories, and that is. I'm a hiker, I, I like to hike around Central Park and I was by myself and I was in the woodsy part of Central Park and when I went for my phone, my, a tissue fell out of my pocket. And I was walking fast, which is my thing to do, and I could have just kept walking. But I stopped and I picked it up and I asked myself, why did I do that? No one's watching. Maybe Hashem, God is watching. But nobody saw this happen. I could have just kept up my pace. And it's good shame that made me say, I would be ashamed of myself if I didn't pick up this tissue. So that's what So I that's mean part of the sermon. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you, Letty thank and, you, and Abby. Thank you, Molly. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think we would all welcome the opportunity to be at your family table for Thanksgiving and to hear s this conversation. <laughs> okay, Thanks. so thank you so much. And thank you all for being here and those online for joining us.